Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who are joining us on our heritage.org website. For those in-house, we would ask you to do that last courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. It is always appreciated. And of course, for those watching online, you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Welcoming our guest and leading our program is Steve Moore, who serves as his distinguished visiting fellow in our Project for Economic Growth. Prior to rejoining Heritage in 2014, Mr. Moore previously wrote for the On the Economy and Public Policy for the Wall Street Journal and was also a member of the journal's editorial board. He served as a senior economist as well of the U.S. Joint Economic Committee under former Chairman Dick Armey of Texas. In 1999, he founded the Club for Growth and served as its president until December 2004. Then, prior to joining the journal, he founded the Free Enterprise Fund to continue, as he does today, advocating for free market economic policy solutions. Please join me in welcoming Steve Moore. Steve? Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming this afternoon. So um, I'm going to start with a question. And Andy, you cannot answer this question because you know the answer. But um, I'm going to give you all a list of states. And um, I want you, to, uh, someone in the audience, to tell me what these states have in common. Texas, California, Tennessee, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Anybody, and there, there are more on this list, but anyone know, anyone know what those states have in common? Or you get Texas and California in I know, exactly. It's, <laughs> those states and six others have the lowest unemployment rate today than any time in the state's history since we've been recording these numbers. Um, the American economy is booming right now. Capitalism has made a comeback, Andy, as your this great book, uh, the capitalist comeback um, documents, um, and so the you know I was telling um, Andy that the timing of this could, book could not be uh, more ideal and appropriate. Um, Andy and I worked together um, early on in the uh, Trump campaign. We both I think have the whiplashes yeah. on our back to prove it, uh, and so uh, Andy pr uh, provided invaluable advice to then candidate Trump, and then worked on the transition as well. Uh, in terms of uh, devising the economic strategy that has worked so well for Donald Trump in his first um, year and a half or so in office. So for those of you who don't know um, all about uh, Andy Puzner, I will read a little bit of his bio because he has an amazing um, biography and amazing, uh, amazing accomplishments. Uh, as a successful CEO in the restaurant industry, Andy Puzder uniquely understands how important the profit motive is to our country's ultimate prosperity. Thur furthermore, as the grandson of immigrants, the son of a car salesman, and someone who worked his way up from earning minimum wage to running an international business. You actually earned the minimum wage. <laughs> so that's a great thing to know. He knows a lot about the capitalist spirit. In 2016, the American people faced a stark choice between two very different presidential candidates, one who spent most of her adult life involved in politics, and promised to uphold and advance the progressive legacy, and one who came from the business world and was an unapologetic capitalist. America was, was once a land uh, of opportunity where everyone was encouraged to seek their fortune. The more prosperous our citizens and the more our whole society could in turn prosper. But leftists forced the United States have been seeking to tarnish the pursuit of pr prosperity. Uh, the capitalist uh, comeback uh, in this book, Andy Puzder, traces the development of the anti-profit forces in the United States and shows how they can be vanquished for good. He is, as many of you know, uh, served as the CEO of uh, one of the largest um, um, fast food restaurant chains in America. Um, he is um, a former resident of California, but had the good sense to move to a no-income tax state of Tennessee. He now lives in Nashville. Um, please give a nice um, round of applause to Andy Puzder. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you. Thank you for coming. And for those of you that are watching, thank you for watching. Uh, as Steve said, I'm Andy Puzder. I ran the company known as CKE Restaurants, which those of you from other parts of the country will know as Carl's Jr. or Hardee's. 
Uh, we ran that ad with Paris Hilton washing the Bentley years ago, and also a more recent ad with all the guys are shaking their just uh, an ad with Kate Upton. Uh, and, and you know, it, our ads were kind of controversial, but before there were controversial ads, and before there were six dollar burgers and Western bacon cheeseburgers, there was a, a guy named Carl Karcher in a hot dog cart. Now, Carl was the quintessential uh, self made American. He and his wife Margaret bought a hot dog cart in 1941. Uh, within a few years, they had four or five hot dog carts. Within a few years after that, they had a restaurant in Orange County, California. And then in 1956, Carl's opened up what was his first hot, uh, hamburger stand, and he called it Carl's Jr. I was CEO of that company for about 17 years, and when I left, we had 3,800 restaurants in 45 states and 40 foreign countries, all from that hot dog stand. It was, a, you know, it was really a, a privilege to know Carl. First, I was his attorney, his personal attorney, and then later I became his, um, uh, the, the, the CEO of the company he founded. Uh, and throughout that entire period of time, he was a gracious friend and a gracious mentor. In fact, I dedicated the book to him and opened it with a quote from Carl, which I'll show you here once I get this to work. No? Any idea what button I push here? Hmm? There it goes. Okay, so this is Carl at the hot dog stand, and... Is this before or after McDonald's? Uh, it was about the same time. The McDonald's brothers were in Riverside, and Carl was in, uh, he was in Anaheim with the first Carl's Jr. restaurant, so very close to each other. But Carl's quote was, the American dream is alive and well in this country of ours. I know it. I lived it. And Carl did understand the American dream perhaps better than most. He understood the, the, the importance of hard work and diligence, particularly in a country, uh, taking advantage of the opportunities in a country that valued hard work and discipline. Carl did understand the American dream because he did live it. And it's one of the reasons we got along so well. I was, uh, I believe in the American dream and I lived it as well. I grew up in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, um, a little place called Chagrin Falls outside of Cleveland, Ohio eventually. And my dad was a car salesman. My grandfather came to this country with millions of Eastern European immigrants uh, in the early 1900s looking for jobs and, and opportunity. Uh, you know, we were a working class family. I, I don't think we ever really thought of ourselves as a working class family back in those days. That's not something you would have thought about, uh, but we were. And uh, of course, everybody in school was working class. So it never really occurred to me that we were different than anybody else. Until uh, my dad asked me if I wanted to go with him to deliver a car to a very rich individual in a very rich area near us called Hunting Valley, where a lot of old wealth lived from when Cleveland was a, a higher ranked city in the country as far as wealth. Anyway, so I went with him. We pull up to these gates, and in my, I was 10 at the time, it's so about 1960, and I pull up to the gates, and you know, in my memory, the gates are just, I don't know, I can't tell you how. How, how big they actually were, but in my mind, they were just enormous. The gates open up and we pull in and there's, we drive for a while and there's this gorgeous house off to the side. Uh, really the nicest house I'd ever seen. It was incredible. It was a manicured lawn. I remember it being white with a dark roof. And uh, my dad kept driving. I said, dad, why, why didn't you stop? And he looked down, he laughed and said, that was the guest house. We kept driving. <laughs> And we went by these stables. This is called Hunting Valley because they do a lot of fox hunting. There's a polo field near where the house is. And, uh, uh, you know, that, look, the stables looked nicer to me than the place. We were living in a little ranch house, which was very nice, but these stables were gorgeous. And we drive up to this huge house. I mean, it's just, I, I, again, I can't tell you how big it really was, but to me it was just enormous. Uh, we walk up to the front door. My dad rings the doorbell. I probably expected a butler or something to answer, but it was Mr. Humphrey He was uh, who owned the house. He was a friend of my father's. They, they got along well, and he, uh, they talked for a little bit. They gave my dad the key to the trade-in. My dad gave him the key to the new car. We're walking back to the car, and I said to my dad, I said, I'm stunned by what... It, I said to my dad, what, what, what does Mr. Humphrey do <laughs> that he can live like this? And my dad said, uh, he's a lawyer and uh, he owns a business. And I, I can still remember thinking, a lawyer. You know, I, I could be a lawyer. <laughs> now the important thing though wasn't what I thought. The important thing was what I didn't think. I didn't think, God, he's in the 1%, he's stealing money from us. You know, we, how can he live like this? And we have such a little house and he has, I, 
know, this is just unfair. This is unreasonable. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't think that. I thought, you know, maybe I could do this. And luckily, I lived in a country where there was a path to do it. Now, it wasn't an easy path. It was an arduous path. I actually did start out at minimum wage at Baskin and Robbins scooping ice cream. And I probably was worth minimum wage. I can't imagine I was worth a whole lot more than that at that point in time. But I went on to work every dirty, tough job you can imagine. I cut lawns. I busted up concrete with a jackhammer in the middle of St. Louis in the summer. And uh, it was, you know, it was whatever job I could get to get my family that and get myself through college and then law school, I did. And eventually I became a lawyer who ran a business. There isn't a country in the history of the world where a working class kid like me could have aspired to that level of success with any chance whatsoever of actually achieving it. Now that's, a, that, that, that's now my story on the American dream. See, I, I understand the American dream like Carl I lived it as well. But that dream's under attack. It's been under attack. And we do things to try and, and, and defend it. You know, I wrote this book to try and help people understand, particularly younger people, how important our excellent, marvelous capitalist system is, both to the American dream and to what our made our nation the great nation that it is, the great nation that it became. If we're going to take advantage of the economic opportunities that President Trump is presenting us with as a nation and as a people, we're going to need to understand who the enemies of capitalism are and how they press their agenda through, across our society, and not just politically, but across every facet of our society. I, I'll give you a clue on how to identify them. You can see them on TV. Well, you see them with Steve a lot on CNN. They're there. <laughs> They're the people that when somebody says Donald J. Trump, they become shrill, acerbic, obnoxious, and loud. You mean like the people at the White House correspondence? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like that. I mean, they're not hard to identify. Uh, they just hate Donald Trump. But I, I'll get back to that. I want to cover why they hate Donald Trump. For right now, I want to stick with my buddy Carl's uh, quote about the American dream being alive and well. You know, it's clearly alive. Uh, how well is it? It's good to keep in mind that in the last election, a very significant portion of Americans wanted to elect an admitted socialist as president of the United States. Now, he calls himself a democratic socialist, but the, you know, all his life, he wanted, uh, he wanted uh, the government to own the means of production, which is a pure socialist. He's now a democratic socialist where he says he doesn't want the government to own the means of production, but he basically wants the, the government to control the companies that own the means of production. In other words, he wants the government to act sort of as a super CEO using tax and regulatory policy to turn the CEOs of, you know, Apple, Ford, Microsoft, uh, Amazon into upper management, all with the objective of creating this huge welfare system that humbles anything that's been done in Denmark or even any of the Scandinavian countries. And I, by the way, it even humbles what he wants to do and what he recently proposed humbles what they just walked away from in Finland uh, because it didn't work. Uh, it, but, you know, he, he didn't become president. Uh, thank God he didn't become president. He didn't even become the nominee. But remember, a lot of people believe with some credible evidence that he didn't become the nominee because the DNC fixed the, fixed the primary election. That's one of the reasons Debbie Wasserman Schultz is no longer the head of the DNC. Hillary Clinton became the nominee, and she moved to the left to try and make the Sandinistas happy, and she lost the election. Donald Trump won. And, you know, that, that, that to me, that showed that the American dream has some life left in it. But if we're going to, we, we can't sit on our loyals in that respect. We have to remember what Ronald Reagan said, and I can go back to it. I didn't mean to move it. No, it's going the wrong way. How do I go back? Yep. This thing just back. doesn't work. I can't get it. There, we go. there you go. I didn't do that. There, <laughs> there we go. I don't know who's doing this, but I'm going to let you do it. Uh, freedom is only one generation away from extinction. And given the current generation, we may have some things to be concerned about. I, you know, this is the, the, the support for Bernie Sanders was basically young people and millennials. And we hear poll after poll saying that young people either find uh, socialism socially acceptable or they prefer it to capitalism. Now, that's, that, that's not a good sign. But you can see what it's done to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, with the election of Donald Trump, has moved so far to the left 
Uh, Bernie Sanders made a good showing, and the, the Democrats went left. They think they can get this, this youth vote. It's to the point where the, the words uh, socialist, progressive, and Democrat really are synonymous. They mean kind of the same thing. Now, it didn't always, it didn't, it wasn't always that way. As you see in the next slide, John Kennedy, for example, uh, talked about a rising tide that lifts all boats. He was referring to that economic tide that lifts everybody. Uh, he, you know, that wealth isn't a zero-sum game where the rich get richer only if the poor get poorer. John Kennedy thought that the economic time would lift rich and poor, and therefore advocated uh, very generous, uh, very significant tax cuts, which passed after his assassination. Uh, even Bill Clinton, and you probably, that's the next slide, you probably didn't think I'd be here saying anything good about Bill Clinton this morning, did you? But Bill Clinton, economically, he did some very good things. He did raise taxes, but he apologized for it, said he raised them too much. Uh, he uh, reformed welfare. He deregulated the banks. He lowered capital gains taxes. He balanced the budget, and he declared in a very famous State of the Union speech, the era of big government is over. Now, can you imagine any Democrat saying that today, or any, any, any Democrat talking about a rising tide lifting all boats. No, the Democrats have become progressive. And the progressives are having a day because of that. And you, to understand uh, how influential they are in our society, you also need to understand how they, they kind of infiltrate different parts of it, like our education system. And I, again, I cover each of these in the book, but education system, where, even high school kids are being taught by a book by an, uh, a historian named Howard Zinn, who's an admitted Marxist and has this warped version of American history as a history of oppression as opposed to a history of uh, individual liberty and uh, economic freedom. You can see it in entertainment and the arts. I mean, even young kids are exposed repeatedly to these uh, storylines where a suspicious number of evil, bad characters are corporate CEOs like me, or corporations, or rich guys, rich women, businessmen, businesswomen, who've realized the American dream. They're demonized as bad. Or you can see in the outsized influence of labor unions in our political process. Uh, now, don't, don't get me wrong. In the last century, labor unions did a lot of good. Who wants 10-year-old kids working in coal mines? No, nobody wants that. They did some real, really very positive things. But beginning with the uh, Roosevelt administration, they started turning over responsibility for protecting workers' rights to the federal government. Now, whether it's the Wage and Hour Division or the EEOC or OSHA, these are all agencies of the federal government. There are many more that are in place to protect workers. So unions start to, started to lose their relevance. And to find relevance and membership, they appeal to the federal government uh, and state governments as well. But this causes them to you know, promote ridiculous things like a $15 an hour minimum wage, which all of the, of the credible research shows hurts the very workers that the unions claim to be trying to help. You know, research out of the San Francisco Federal Reserve, uh, researchers from the Harvard School of Business, uh, London School of Economics, UC Irvine, University of Washington, they all come to the same conclusions in these cities where you've actually implemented a $15 minimum wage. Now, UC Berkeley, you can get some different opinions, but you got to go to UC Berkeley to get them. And, and the membership knows this. Union, union leadership has lost touch with its membership, and you can see it most you know, blatantly in this last election, where despite the fact that union leadership put over $100 million into Hillary Clinton's campaign, 42% of union households voted for President Trump. And that includes government unions. And government unions want big government, right? They're, they're made to be Democrats. They want more money in government. That's how they improve their lives, if there's more money coming to the government. If you took government unions, government employee unions, out of the calculation, it's something like 60% of private sector union members have voted for President Trump. I mean, this is, union membership has just lost touch with its membership. That doesn't mean unions should go away or there isn't a good purpose for them, but right now, They've lost touch. So progressives, progressives have infiltrated various parts of our society, and they have deep roots in socialism. They've been around over 100 years, and they're not going to back off. They're not going to stop. And they think anybody who has anything to do with business is a villain. If you benefit from business, you're a villain. And by the way, if you have a job, you're benefiting from business. 
So progressives are looking at you. Now, I also wrote the book to remind people of, our, of the legacy of our free market capitalist system. You know, our, our founders, uh, they, they declared independence not only because they wanted personal liberty, but also because they wanted economic freedom. They didn't want to be dictated to by a large faraway government on how they should run their businesses. Does that sound familiar? The Boston Tea Party was, after all, about taxes. Now, luckily, when they were setting up a government, they had somewhere to look. In 1776, the year we declared independence, was also the year that a guy named Adam Smith came out with a book called The Wealth of Nations. That's the short title. The long title, I'd have to extend my speech. That's a long title. But it's The Wealth of Nations, which basically gave an example of how you set up a, a modern market economy, something to work off of. So what we ended up with in the United States was a... Uh, an experiment not only in, in, in individual freedom and personal liberty, but an experiment in economic freedom. And, it, and that experiment has gone spectacularly well. If we can go to the next slide. This is a, this is a graph that's taken from data that was prepared by uh, Angus Madison, and after his death in 2010, the Angus Madison Project. I don't know if you can see it. It's in the book, if you get the book. Uh, but what he did was he went back to the year zero, so if you're religious, the year Christ was born, and took GDP per person for the world, he calculated GDP per person, divided uh, GDP <laughs> divided by the number of people on the planet. And as you can see, for centuries, centuries, the world lived in poverty. I mean, aristocrats lived very well, the elite lived very well, but mostly, People were living in abject poverty. Western Europe started to go up a little with mercantilism, uh, with the British Empire. But again, where'd the wealth go? It went to aristocrats. It didn't go to the impoverished masses. And then there was the United States. We put in a capitalist system that allowed people to take advantage of the opportunities in their lives, that allowed people to take advantage of hard work and determination like Carl did. And look what happened. Within 100 years, 13 backwoods colonies became the largest economy in the world. Within a few years after that, we had the best standard of living, the highest standard of living in the world. Now, I showed this to one of my sons uh, who said, yeah, but it was the Industrial Revolution. Well, you know, there was an Industrial Revolution in Western Europe and Japan too, right? Look at the chart for Western Europe and Japan. After World War II, Japan actually shoots up above Western Europe. That was because of American free enterprise capitalism. Western Europe shoots up as well. The defeat of the National Socialists, the National Socialists being the Nazi Party. Look at Eastern Europe after the fall of the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. Look at China after it implements red capitalism, not even real pure capitalism, but red capitalism. American capitalism has lifted the entire world and since the fall of the Soviet Union, we have eliminated poverty on a massive scale across the planet because of American free enterprise capitalism. And all you got to do is look at this graph to see who's leading the world in that effort. Now, who drives that? Well, it's those self-made American men and women. Uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, who started out with a, a little boat that was taking people over to Manhattan Island, ended up being a railroad magnet and the richest man in the United States. Or Madam C.J. Walker, who's one of my favorites. She, started, she was the daughter of slaves in Louisiana, moves, moves north, lives in St. Louis for a while, then Colorado, starts a cosmetic company. By the time she dies around 1910, she's the first female uh, self-made millionaire in America. Uh, we, th we think she's that. It's hard to tell. She's definitely the first African-American female self-made millionaire in the United States. But she may have been the, most, the first female overall. A an amazing person, and I talk about her in the book. Another one is Frederick Trump, by the way, who came over from Germany and ran saloons in the gold rush. Made some money, left it to his son. His son started a real estate business in New York, left the money to his son, who created a multi-billion dollar real estate empire on an international scale and became president of the United States. This is why the progressives hate him. He understands the American dream because his family lived it. He understands capitalism because in his day-to-day -day life, he lived it every day. He's got the potential to do what Ronald Reagan did and produce an economy that's so spectacular, so dynamic, coming out of a sluggish economy. 
that it takes the progressives 20 years to again convince the American people to vote for a big government progressive. They, they, are, they live in fear of Donald Trump's success. You know, when I would go on shows, and Steve as well, back during the Obama administration, we would criticize the president's economic policies. I never criticized the president, by the way, which is a whole other subject we could get into. But I did criticize his economic policies because I didn't think they would work. I thought we would end up with anemic economic growth. People wouldn't have jobs. And in fact, that's what happened. Steve did the same thing. That's not what's happening today. Today, I don't think that people are out there criticizing President Trump's economic policies on the left because they think that those economic policies, can you go to the next slide, please, uh, will fail. I think they're challenging his economic policies because they're afraid they'll succeed. You know, this is, uh, this is our friend Bernie Sanders up there. I mean, the last thing he wants in the world is for American prosperity right now to go up, for people to become content with our capitalist system because their lives are better, their kids' lives are better, their futures are better, there's opportunity. You know, there's a chance to do things you never could have done. Think what Steve Jobs would have done in a socialist society. Would we have had Apple? Jeff Bezos, would we have had, uh, would we have had Amazon? Henry Ford, would we have had Fords? Now, these people weren't making products for aristocrats. They're making products for the common man and the common woman in a country where if you can satisfy the needs of the masses, you can improve your life. There haven't been a lot of countries like that in the history of the world. In fact, we were the first, and, and you know, I, I don't know, I hope we won't be the last, but we're one of the only ones where you can really realize that quintessential American dream. Now, I, I wrote this book to get that word out. You can go to the next slide if you don't mind. I wrote the book to get the word out. I think the comment that I get most about the book is, I wish that we could use this as a textbook in high school or in college, because uh, nobody's getting it done. But people that read the book have said that to me repeatedly. I want you to know that I, despite the fact that it's a capitalist con comeback, and despite all my praise for a profit motive, I'm going to give all the proceeds of the profits to charity. Uh, I'm going to donate them to a charity that encourages entrepreneurship in the minority community um, for youth, minority youth. Uh, I think that's an important thing to do. Look, I, I owe this country a lot. I've done very well here. I, I can, I'm, I'll survive whether or not I keep the profits from this book, and I don't want people out there thinking I'm doing this, you know, like a James Comey kind of thing where it's, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a, a higher profit. Uh, I, no, I'm not going to make any money on the book. Uh, I will donate the proceeds to charity because I think that it's important uh, that this word get out, and I think we need messengers to send it out. And um, I happen to live it, so I'm hoping I'm a messenger that people will find at least has some credibility. So we're going to do questions, but God bless you all, and may God bless the United States of America. As Ronald Reagan said, the last great hope of man on earth. Thank you. Stay up there since people will be, oh, sure. you know, and then I'll, I'll, I'll start just with sit next to you. Let you a couple answer questions. So, um, <laughs> so what has worked for Trump? Um, you know, we see a very robust expansion. What, what would you say are some of the policies that Trump has put in place that have made a difference? Well, you probably would give a, a much better and more complete answer to this than me, but I, I'm going to give you a real simple answer. Uh, on the, on the, literally the day of the election, but you can only see the results because it's the month of the election. The National Federation of Independent Businesses has something called the Monthly Optimism Index, and it goes like this. And then November 2016, it goes like this. And then it goes like this. It keeps going up. We've had 16 consecutive months of business optimism being in the top 5% of the 45-year history of that survey. Last year at this time, optimism in the manufacturing community was 56.6%. This year it's 93%. I'm telling you what, if you incentivize businesses to grow, if they're not afraid, I, you know, I, I ran a big company, but it really was a big company made up of a lot of small companies because they were all, 95% of our restaurants were franchised. So I've got a bunch of franchisees, we had over 200, and uh, that's domestically, we had probably another 40 uh, internationally. Um, and I, I still talk to him. So I, I asked uh, after the election, uh, when optimism went up and you know, everybody was kind of getting excited, I asked people, I said, so what's different for you? 
and had to synthesize about 10 answers into one answer. What I got back was, I'm not waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning wondering what next big government program is going to come down to kill me, like Dodd-Frank that closed my bank and Obamacare that's raising my cost for medical insurance. And I'm not wondering what the next regulation they're going to dream up that nobody ever thought, you know, the weird things that kept coming out of this regulatory state, which is completely out of control. And one of the things that President Trump's getting under control. So I think optimism in the business community went up, but that's not enough. You then had to live up to the promise. We didn't live up to it on Obamacare, but we, he lived up to it on taxes, and he more than lived up to it on regulatory reform. He's doing a spectacular job on both of those. So I think the lack of fear and actual progress, and you're seeing, we've gone, I was telling Steve before this meeting, we've gone from an economy where every time we did an interview, the questions were, Andy, people are dropping out of the labor force. They're, nobody can find a job. Uh, they're working part-time in your restaurants. They're working minimum wage in your restaurant. They're overqualified. What are we going to do? The world's falling apart. The economy's terrible. Two, within 16 months, an economy where the biggest problem is employers can't find enough employees to fill the good-paying jobs. You know, that's the problem we're facing today. So I think that's my, actually was a longer answer than I thought. <laughs> um, the, uh, you, for the last, 10, 15 years have really been on the front line of the minimum wage debate. You've taken some heat for it, obviously. Um, but a lot of the restaurants that um, your franchises owned and their employees were, a lot of those were minimum wage jobs. And what is your, you know, it's difficult for us because if you're not for a higher minimum wage, you don't care about poor people, you don't want, you know, people to do at the bottom to, to see the gains that, you know, people at the uh, upper incomes have seen. What is your, how do you defend, um, you know, the current policy and how would you, what would your be, if you were president, what would you do about the minimum wage? Well, I, I think, number one, I've, I've said for years that you could raise the minimum wage to the point where it doesn't destroy entry-level jobs. Where it destroys entry-level jobs. You'd, by the way, I told Elizabeth Warren that she refused to believe me. I even showed her things I wrote <laughs> that said that, and she still wouldn't believe it. But you can raise it to the point where it doesn't kill entry-level jobs. The problem is, you know, you get when you start destroying entry-level jobs, you're really act, you're, you're taking away that job that got me in the labor force at Baskin Robbins, the job where you learn about showing up on time, you learn about working on a team. You learn what it means. You get that, that self-satisfaction, that dignity and respect that comes with that job. Because not everybody can go to a four-year college. Not everybody has parents that are going to put them through school. Not everybody can get a government loan to get through school. Some people don't, really shouldn't go to school. They'd be better off going right into the labor force. And who's going to train them? You know, we train them and we pay them to be trained. I remember the proudest day. This will, this will make you laugh, I hope, anyway. But my pro the proudest day in my professional career was when that Baskin Robbins franchisee called me in her office after about a year, handed me a key to the front door and said, I'm giving you a 10 cent an hour raise. So I went to a buck 10. Give me a 10 cent an hour raise and, uh, and you can open and close. You're now the assistant manager. I'll tell you what, the next morning when I walked in that restaurant, I'll bet within a half an hour that was the cleanest Baskin Robbins in the United States of America. Uh, that's a, that gives you the kind of pride and dignity and self-respect that keeps you, you know, it keeps you in school, it keeps you out of gangs, it keeps you close to your family. If we start giving that up for this, this mythical land where the government can raise wages and it doesn't affect businesses, I mean, look, if that were true, what would be the dominant uh, a political and economic power in the world today? It would be the Soviet Union. I mean, if that worked, Venezuela would be doing spectacularly well. That doesn't work. What we have works. So don't kill jobs. If you don't kill jobs, I'm with you. So you must be a lot older than me, because my first minimum wage job was two dollars and ten cents. I, I am a lot older than you, and 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 I look it. Uh, but it, it's. <laughs> so um, I want to press you on this because it is such sure. a you know front you know uh, front page issue now. Um, the good news is we've seen. I'm sure you saw this that Walmart and Costco, two of our biggest employers in the United States. They've raised their minimum wage without the government. I mean, I think they've gone up to twelve, thirteen dollars an hour because right. of a tight labor market. Um, isn't that the best way to to see? Yeah, economic change? growth. Look, look the, here, here. This is uh, this is the, an economic lesson in, in one or two sentences. I'd have to think about which what it is. When employees compete with each other for jobs, wages stagnate or go down. When employers compete for employees, wages go up. You don't need a minimum wage. <laughs> 
They will go up if there's economic growth, which we argued for for eight years during the Obama administration. If there's economic growth, like we're seeing now, we've had 3.1% average GDP growth for the first three quarters. If you add in this most recent quarter, it's 2.9%. If the most recent quarter goes up three, three tenths of a percentage point like fourth quarter did, then we're gonna be at 3%. I mean, we're, we're on the cusp of 3% after 15 months. And you can see the result in the jobs. Wages are increasing. The, the, the data that just came out, um, we're going to wait and see what happens Friday. Right, right. But the data that just came out indicates there's pressure on wages. So I guarantee you, it, when, we're, when we're unable to pull people back into the labor force who have dropped out, in other words, people that are just kind of hanging on the sidelines, when we lose that, when, when employers are then competing for all employees, you're going to see wages, wages are going up. Inflation is going to go up. Wages are going to go up. The stock market's not going to do as well because interest rates will be higher. You know, it's going to have nothing to do with the economy, but when interest rates go up, people take money out of the stock market and they invest in interest-bearing instruments. I know I will. Uh, anyway. Go ahead. We'll, we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, and just uh, pl please um, keep your question as brief as possible so we can get to as many as possible. I'll try and keep my answers briefer. Barbara Bowie Whitman. I, too, started at minimum wage at a dollar an hour. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, and I spent my first $100 earned to buy a share of the stock that employed my father. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good for you. I was probably going out with my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the question, you all have provided some nice segues into it. How concerned are you about overheating? Because all the uh, bad news bears say, Oh, we've, we've made these changes, but we're going to be overheating and everything is going to go bad. Yeah. Um, gosh, I wish I'd have heard that five, six years ago. I, I, uh, no, I'm not worried about the economy overheating. I think the, we, we've got plenty of room to grow. We've had eight years of basically, I mean, we had eight years of 2.1% GDP growth. Uh, what does that mean? Well, coming out of the last 10 recessions prior to this one, the average GDP growth was 4.3%. The Obama administration economists back in 2009 projected that GDP growth would be 3.8% in 2011 and 4% plus in 2012 and 13. It was 2.1% average in the last quarter that we had under President Obama was 1.5%. Now, look, I, I don't think President Obama was a bad guy. He was probably a pretty good guy. But, I, but his economic policies were just wrong. I mean, they just were not good economic policies. And we now have good economic policies. And I don't, I don't know. Are you worried about overheating? It's a great problem for a country to have. Yeah, right? yeah. The New York Times is, you know, yeah. the same people who said we couldn't get the 2% growth on the New York Times editorial page are now, now that the economy is booming, are saying the economy is overheating. So Jason Furman, last April, says 2% GDP growth for 10 years. Jason Furman was an Obama administration economist. Larry. Summers last May said, and I quote, believing in the Trump administration's projections of 3% GDP growth is like believing in tooth fairies. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the uh, third quarter of 2000, I mean, 1983, you'll remember this, that 8.7% growth, 8.7. <laughs> so, you know, the economy can expand a lot faster. Or under, under uh, Kennedy. Uh, or under Johnson after the Kennedy tax cuts. We were at 5, 6, 7 percent for like three, four years. Next question. Hello, my name is Ellen. I'm a junior at American University studying poli-sci. And I'm, I'm from Massachusetts, so my family is very much of the, um, probably not as many of them in the room, very pro-Clinton and um, very democratic, so um, I'm just here to learn and try to get more perspectives. And oh, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I just was wondering if you could talk more about service and how you have um, just served the public, whether that be through philanthropy and just talking about the effectiveness of like government services versus private sector services. Well, I, I think if people choose to choose to engage in uh, in government service, it's a it's a great way to serve. I mean, I. I'm, I'm quite honestly, I'm trying to serve by writing this book. I mean, it was, I, I think this is a message that needed to get out. Um, when I was, by the time I graduated from law school, I had uh, a wife who was pregnant. We had two kids and I had, um, I, you know, I was, I was tired <laughs> when I was working. You know, I kind of working my butt off, I had to work a job through law school and I was on law quarterly and I was, so I didn't really think a lot about service at that point in my life. 
Uh, but I, I think now, like I said, I'm going to turn the profits over and do what I can to try and see that this message gets out there. I think, I think service is great. I think companies need to do things that uh, benefit the community. I think there's more pressure on companies that have a, um, a uh, left-leaning clientele like Starbucks. I think there's more pressure on Starbucks to you know, do things than there is on Chick-fil-A to do things because they have more of a right-leaning that's not to say that people that are on the left don't eat a Chick-fil-A or that people that are on the right don't go to Starbucks. You know, my wife loves Starbucks. Uh, but, uh, but you have to, you have to, you know, these people, even when they're talking, I will tell you that even when people are talking about doing social justice things, you probably find out they think it's good for business in addition to being good for the community. And so I, I think that's, uh, but I, I think it's, it's fine. I think it's a good thing to do and I would encourage Andy, it. you're being way too modest. I mean, look, <laughs> How many people? How many people did CKE um, employ uh, worldwide? About one hundred and fifteen thousand in the United States, about seventy-five thousand. But that's with our franchisees, about yeah. seventy-five thousand. So I mean, look, I mean, this is really important, I think, for people to understand. I mean, your service to the country is what you did to grow this business. Well, I that's mean, true. you know, there's just no question about it. I mean, I always say, Bill Gates' service to the country is not the Gates Foundation. It's not. I mean, the Gates Foundation will have a modest impact on the world. His service was creating this, uh, you know, this company that, that provided computers and so on. So don't be so defensive. I mean, you, you, really, truly, the businessman is serving the, the world, right? Yes. And, it, and Carl would be a good example. Carl Karcher was very, very charitable. But just think about the hundreds of thousands of jobs and careers and families you know, he helped through what he did. Uh, through his business. So I, Steve's right. I got, I got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, sir. My name is Jason Ku from Wintop Group. Uh, what is your opinion on mm, the possibility for a Democrat being converted into a conservative? And on the, on the, on the direction, in what occasion a uh, Republican will switch back to Democrat. And uh, the third relevant question is, f when a young kid grows up, uh, grows in the process of growing up, what is the very important switch that the young kid will make the decision to, like your story of uh, when seeing that rich lawyer you made the decision of that I want to become one instead of uh, start blaming uh, the inf unfairness, blah, blah, blah. So, so what is that uh, fundamental switch that split American into these two huge sections? Well, as far as the Democrat becoming more conservative, I, you know, when I, when, I, the, when I was that 10-year-old kid pulling into Mr. Humphrey's estate, John, you know, it was the year John Kennedy was elected. I mean, there was a conservative um, a Democrat, a, a capitalist, it wasn't a social conservative, but a conservative Democrat sitting in the White House who was conservative on defense as well. And, and despite what you hear about Bill Clinton, I think he governed, and, you know, Art Laffer voted for Bill Clinton, you know, our buddy. Uh, it, you know, he, he did many things that you would do as a conservative and was, and was very successful. So when people compare Republican and Democratic presidents uh, and their economic success, I always like to point out, yeah, but two of them like ruled like or, or governed like, uh, like Republicans. Um, and with respect to the economy. As far as, look, this is, I, I wrote this book, you know, part of it's just a frustration with the fact that kids aren't being exposed to the benefits uh, that come with being born an American. I mean, this is, a this is a country that millions and millions of people left their homes, their families as teenagers, as kids. They got on boats that under the worst of conditions to come here for the opportunities we take for granted. And uh, so I think, from you know, for me it was the book, uh, but I, I and I, I you know I teach my I, I have six kids I have three older kids they're 45 43 and one will turn 40 this year and then three younger kids that are 25 22 and 20. With the older kids I didn't have to teach them history and economics in high school. With the older three I did because they weren't learning it in school, and I know they came home and we'd have to talk about it because they were. You know, they were looking at history books that talked about the fall of the Soviet Union and gave Ronald Reagan, they didn't even mention Reagan. I mean, you know, this is, it's, it's we've allowed uh, some institutions in our society to get out of our control, and I think we, I think we need to uh, get them back and, and uh, have them give a little more fair 
There was an article in Fox Opinion uh, yesterday, the day before, about a new history book that comes out and talks about President Trump. You know, the, the guy's only been in office 15 months. They're saying he was, you know, his opponents believe him to be mentally unstable. <laughs> that, that's in a history book? I mean, guy's been president 15 months. Yeah, I, <laughs> anyway, I think we need to reach him at a young age. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for your intervention. You spoke about, you speak about uh, Cleveland, I'm thinking about Kirby, a company with which I worked where you start by doing door-to-door -door sales, but in a few months you know everything about selling because it's practical and it helps you to make money. But my question is about the obvious one. What are the indicators that shows how the left trying to plot against this economic boom everybody is welcoming? I yeah, I think, the, I think the education system, their takeover of the education system, if you look at the book, there's something called the Heterodox Academy uh, for our in colleges, which is some professors, many of whom are liberal. The one who set it up is a liberal professor who's very upset about the lack of intellectual diversity in college campuses. Uh, we've really, and look, all you gotta do is read the newspaper. You're not even allowed to talk about, well, I, I was a kid at Kent State before the shootings. I went one semester after the shootings. And, you know, the university was very conservative, the faculty, but they never, they didn't stop the Berrigan brothers or Tom Hayden. Anybody wanted to come in to talk could talk because you let everybody talk. It was a college campus, for God's sake. She wanted everybody to come in. Now, now that's, that you don't do that. Look at entertainment. It's hard to find. You know, look at, look at Roseanne. She goes, she says, I voted for Trump. Her character votes for Trump. That's the highest ratings, like, I don't know, ever. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> because there's no shows. You know, you can watch Grey's Anatomy. You can watch Modern Family. They're, they're, they're good shows, my wife and I have watched all of them. But there, there's a political philosophy behind them. And then uh, Tim Allen gets his show, uh, The Last Man Standing, which was the second most popular, most watched show on ABC, canceled because he was a conservative. You, they, they in, they're infiltrating everywhere they possibly can. And... You know, we need to react, and but to react, people have to know it's happening. So I wrote a book. <laughs> yes, sir. Eric. <laughs> yeah, I'm, ja I'm Jack Yos. I teach management at the Catholic University of America. There will be uh, at least one class that will have that as a All textbook right. uh, for my interns. <laughs> um, uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. But uh, I, I want to take you back uh, to what you were talking about earlier about regulation, because with your previous company under the previous administration, you were very slow very slow to open any restaurants in California. Can you talk about regulations and reining that in and how that works? Yeah, we stopped opening restaurants in California. Actually, we sold a bunch, uh, you know, to our franchisees, not to competitors. We refranchised them. You couldn't make money. I mean, the minimum wage there is going to $15 an hour. There, and, and it's a, um, I mean, I could write a book on trying to run a business in California. You weren't allowed to compensate your general managers. They if they work 50% of their time in non-managerial tasks, you had to pay them overtime. You couldn't pay them a salary. Well, you know, if you run a business, you own the business, right? But if you want to work 50% of your time in, in non-managerial tasks, we compensate our general managers with a bonus to incentivize them to run the restaurants like they own the restaurants. They make, you know, you can make 80 grand running a Carl Jr. or a Hardee's. Um, but we had to stop that. We had to start turning them into hourly employees because the law said if they work 50% of their time in non-managerial tasks, uh, you know, hell, I was the CEO. I would pick up cigarette butts when I walked into the restaurant. If the drink bar was dirty, I'd clean it. Wouldn't you do that if you owned a restaurant? Well, in California, you, you know, you, you, it's the, the law, there was the labor laws in California. If, if California is foretelling our future as it has in other areas, so we're in big trouble. I mean, we're in big trouble. Speak in the speak, hour, speak in the microphone. Would you, uh, with regard to $15 an hour, would you tell that how much Carl Jr. or yourself you were making? And I have um, how much what? How much you guys were making. Uh, as a company or me individually? Or, I, mean, I, <laughs> I mean, don't know what you're asking. Individually. What individual. we were paying employees. We, we didn't pay anybody. Min and, yeah, you work a minimum. You work, by the way, you work in a restaurant. You're there more than a month and you're making minimum wage. Something's wrong. I mean, you know, we don't, so there are really, long. yeah, I mean, we had like, I don't know, it was like two, three. And my, follow, my follow up is uh, how the children of those people, you know, the $15 or minimum wage, they can compete with the upper 1% that you are talking about. How can the children of, of the. How can the children 
families earning minimum wage compete with the top one? Well, you can do what you can do what I did. You just work as hard as you can. There's nothing to stand in your way. And and tell you what, you know, it isn't always an advantage to be a parent of a rich kid. I got to tell you what, I've I've raised kids as a as a as a man of means, and I raised kids as a law student. And it was a lot easier to raise them when I was poor, <laughs> I, you know, because you, you really you're not tempted to, to give them everything you possibly can give them. They've got to work, and and they, uh, you know, my older kids came out great. I got one of our nation's nuclear physicists, an attorney, and a fashion designer, and I'm hoping the next three will come out okay too. But we'll we'll have to wait and see. But it's you know the problem with the fifteen dollar minimum wage is that you can't. Kids need those jobs. I needed my minimum wage job at fifteen dollars an hour. If if the job that you're compensating somebody for doesn't have an economic return that justifies hiring that employee. In other words, if they're not at least producing as much enough economic benefit uh, where you'll break even if you hire them, you're going to get rid of them. You're, you're going to get rid of the jobs. You're going you're to uh, automate, or you're going to go out of business, or you're going to tell people to make more. They have to work harder. Uh, but those jobs will disappear. And then those kids that are competing with the 1% will have nothing to compete with the 1%. You know, Andy, when I was at the Wall Street Journal on the editorial board there, one of the thrills of that was just meeting really successful people who would come in all the time for editorial board meetings. And, and these were people at the top of their game, whether it was in finance or economics or business or sports or whatever it was. And um, so this was, you know, week after week, we'd meet these folks. And I would always ask them, you know, wh wh where, where'd you come from? What, what, and it was surprising to me. Um, what, how large a percentage of these very successful people grew up on a farm, grew up on a farm. Because if you grow up on a farm, I don't know if anybody in this room grew up on a farm, but if you grow up on a farm, you start working when you're about eight or nine years old. You know? um, and I, you're so right. I mean, sometimes, you know, I think as a parent, what mistakes have I made? I don't think we, we our kids, we gotta drive them even more. Working is the one of the most, the other thing is we've done these studies at Heritage that show that the earlier you start working in your life, so those are those 17-year-olds that are working yep. in your restaurant, the higher their lifetime earnings are. So working at a young age, even if it's a minimum wage job, pays off hugely in terms of your you know, producer earnings. So sometimes I think some of those poor kids may have advantages over the ones who, have, who are given everything. You know, I, you know, I certainly don't feel, I mean, I went to school with, you know, I went to Washington University for law school, and yeah, I, I don't know that anybody else there was working. I mean, there's all, you know, a lot of parents, a lot of government money. Uh, I, I didn't resent it then, and I don't resent it now. I, you know, I, I, I busted my butt to get through, and I'm feeling pretty good about it. You know, I'll, I'll speak at a lot of events, not always to think tanks, but a lot of times to restaurant industry groups, and <laughs> you'd be surprised, or, or, or business groups. How many people, how many CEOs and business people come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I got my start at a basket. I got my start at a Wendy's. I got it at a Burger King. I got it at a Carl's or a Hardee's. I'll, I'll bet you can't find a major company in the United States that doesn't have top executives that got their initial business experience in a fast food restaurant. <laughs> I, you know, this is, you know, this is a, a we train America's workforce, and um, and you don't have to pay us tuition to do it. <laughs> All right. You know? One or two more quick questions, if there are any more. Yes, Tim. Thanks so much for being here. Um, my pleasure. Some of the things that we do here are talking about developing the workforce. And um, um, I lived and worked in Northwest Ohio for three years. And one of the things is, hey, we've got way too many jobs and not enough people that can pass drug tests to, to fill them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, as somebody who pretty much thrived on a, a workforce, um, if, if you have any thoughts or opinions on how we can pursue this problem happening. As a matter of fact, if I, you know, I was nominated to be Secretary of Labor. I didn't have the votes in the Senate. And my, uh, my plan, had that been the case, uh, was to really focus the department on apprenticeships and internships. And I think Alex is doing that, Alex Acosta, who's now Secretary of Labor, and Ivanka is very big on this. We need to get people prepared for these jobs. And the president's very focused on this opioid ep uh, epidemic. We need, to get, uh, we need to get the number of people on drugs reduced. I, you know, we, I'm not an expert on uh, addiction. But I've got to believe there's a way to get people back in the workforce. I, I also think it's important to get former inmates back in the workforce, uh, you know, to reduce the recidivism rate. So there are a lot of things I would have liked to have done. I think Alex would probably do all of them. I'm not being critical of him. Uh, but I think we need – that is a role the government can play. I think the government can be very helpful there. And I think the government should work with the private sector on job trainings programs. I would not have any 
government job training programs that weren't executed in connection with the private sector because the private sector knows what training they need, they know what jobs are opening. You know, you, and they spend, I think, three times as much as the government on jobs training. So we, we, I, I think there are things the government can do, uh, but this, this is a private sector problem too. The private sector needs to step it up and they're going to have to, either that they, they're gonna, cause they're not gonna have employees if they don't do something. So Andy, I wanna, we, we gotta close this up, but I wanna, on the way out, ask you about, um, your, you mentioned the fact that you had been nominated to be the labor secretary. You were, there were, um, you and I have talked a lot about this, you know, um, some vile and false accusations against you that were used against you. And now we are seeing that throughout the administration. We saw what happened to the VA secretary. Uh, what's, hap what's happening now um, t uh, against um, Scott Pruitt at the EPA, who's doing the president's bidding and he's creating jobs and cleaning up the environment. <laughs> this is such an environment that is hostile to getting good people in government. I wonder your thoughts about this, having lived through it yourself. Now, by the way, if, if you want to know more about what happened in the confirmation process, the introduction to the book, I covered it, because everybody always asks. So I figured I might as well get it in writing right. So that's the introduction to the book. It, I don't deal with it throughout the book, but I deal with it in the introduction. Uh, my mistake, I think, uh, was not defending myself. Um, at, when you're a nominee you're, uh, for a uh, cabinet position, you are not allowed to defend yourself. Actually, Jeb Bush uh, tweeted, uh, congratulations, Andy. Uh, this is the day I'm nominated. Congratulations, Andy. You'll be a great labor secretary. And I, I, I literally tweeted back, thanks, Jeb, who's a, he's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I said, Th man, the, the transition committee went nuts. I mean, they, they're like, you can't communicate, you can't tweet, you can't talk. And I, you know, for some people, I understand that. There are some cabinet nominees who you probably want to be quiet till the hearing. But I mean, I was a trial lawyer. You know, I was on TV all the time. I could have defended myself, and I was attacked you know, there were, they took allegations of abuse that my former wife made in our divorce proceeding 30 years ago, which she had admitted in writing on TV to every, anybody who would listen that they weren't true, that her lawyer made her do it, and uh, her lawyer disagreed with me politically on an issue and was after me because he thought I might want to run for governor, which I never would have because I couldn't have afforded it. But the... Uh, but that was that, and, and despite the fact that, you know, I got to be the only guy in America with a Me Too problem who has nobody accusing him of anything. <laughs> I don't, there's no victim. There's, you know, I, I don't, it's hard to defend yourself. But it becomes a very, very malicious process. What happened to uh, Admiral Jackson or Dr. Jackson is, 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 it's ridiculous. I mean, Barack Obama and George W. Bush both thought this guy was wonderful. I mean, uh, President Obama promoted him to Admiral. Uh, and, and then it turns out, after he's out, they just find out that the uh, Secret Service has absolutely no record of this, apparently this drunk incident where he was pounding on a door or something. They have no record of it ever having happened. He denies it happened. There's nothing. But this man's life, his reputation has been besmirched, and he had to pull out. And it's, it's bad. It's a, the one thing that I'm afraid of, uh, it worries me about my having withdrawn uh, my nomination uh, when I didn't have the votes. That's the only reason I withdrew. But the one thing that worries me about it is that it will discourage other people in the business community you know, from doing what I did, which was speaking out and getting slapped down for it by, uh, you know, by, the, by the left and the progressives who want this president to fail. I mean, that's, that's what you really have to keep in mind. They want him to fail. They don't want him to implement policies that they agree with that will succeed. They want him to fail. And um, uh, so we, you know, we, the business community has to stand up. I had an op-ed on this in Fox Business Online last week about CEOs needing to speak up. And there's a chapter on it in the book, uh, chapter nine. So oh, please the, take the book a look. is The Capitalist Comeback. Uh, Andy, thank you for writing this. We need My to pleasure. get it in schools. You know, we need to get it in high schools and colleges because it is such an important message. Please give a nice uh, round of applause to Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.